it looks like people are joining Bree and we have about 25 people in so far. Wonderful. It's reminding me now only people old as, as old as me will remember a Telerama reference. Do you remember the Telerama weekends? And so it was a fundraiser that would go on over the weekend and the numbers would just kind of slowly click up on your, you know, one of your three channels. <laughs> Um, so yeah, wonderful. So I see 27 participants, 28. So maybe we'll just pause, uh, probably another 30 seconds to a minute, just to make sure everyone, uh, has time to make their way into the webinar. And maybe we're just going to hold out at 28, which is a lovely number. And, uh, we're super thrilled to be joined, uh, by 29 folks today for our, uh, our lunchtime conversation with our special guests. We'll give it just a few more seconds and then we'll get started at 12.05. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bree Claude and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. We are very excited uh, to be hosting this webinar from Savita proper. Welcome to Savita. And uh, we're even more excited about the guests that we will be uh, engaging in dialogue with today and learning from today, as well as all of you, uh, 31 folks who have joined us today um, on our webinar. So welcome and thank you so much for coming. So as we get started today, um, it's really important for us that we start in a good way and that we acknowledge the lands in which we are uh, speaking from and coming from and having the honor of uh, living joyful and well lives. Um, it's just a really important piece of uh, one very small piece of uh, moving towards reconciliation. And so we'd like to uh, take a, a special moment to acknowledge the lands that we are uh, speaking from today. And so we are here in Treaty 6 lands, and it's the traditional territory of the Plains Cree and an ancient gathering place of many Indigenous peoples for thousands of years. These lands have also been the home to an essential trading place of the Blackfoot, the Nakoda, Assiniboine, Dene, and the Métis people. We recognize that all Albertans are Treaty people and have a responsibility to become aware of our shared history understand the spirit and intent of Treaty 6, and by doing so that we can honor the past, be aware of the present, and create a just and caring future built upon peace, friendship, and understanding. So now we very much look forward uh, to starting our dialogue today. Um, and my name is Bree Close. So just really quickly, uh, I am so fortunate to be uh, the Vice President of Customer Experience and Community Partnerships here uh, at Savita Housing. And uh, working uh, within community partnerships means that I get to work with the fine folks that you're going to meet today. Uh, our objectives for today, we have kind of an exciting, um, an exciting itinerary. So we're really looking forward to sharing with you the innovative practices and strategies that are taking place in our communities and within Savita communities today. Uh, we know that the folks that we're bringing forward are doing very special and amazing work. And we also know that more special and amazing work can be uh, generated and uh, inspired uh, from our conversation today. So we're really looking forward to that. So next, I have the honor and the privilege of introducing our three very, very special guests. Um, our first guest is Vanessa Dessa. And Vanessa is the founding member and board chair of Riverbend Rocks. Vanessa is originally from Kenya and has lived in Edmonton for the last 41 years. Her career in the government and nonprofit sector has led her to become an advocate for equity-seeking communities, immigrant children and youth, and community development approaches. Anyone who has met Vanessa, and I can attest to this personally, knows that Vanessa will gladly talk your ear off about the joys and the passions that make her jump out of bed in the morning, which are gardening, singing to her first grandchild, Layla, who turns four months old today. Oh, today, that is very special. Happy birthday, Layla. And belonging to a vibrant, caring, and deeply connected intercultural and intergenerational community. So welcome, Vanessa. Next, I have the privilege of introducing Tracy Patience. Tracy has been supporting the community for over two decades. Her love for community-based work led her to become an outreach worker. 
And in 2001, she became the executive director of Amity House. And she's been helping to build a sense of community and reducing social isolation among vulnerable people in our city ever since. We're super grateful to have Tracy with us today. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you for coming. Our third guest we're thrill thrilled to introduce is David Berger. And David has been working on the O'Damon Village Community Building Project for the past eight months. Prior to that, David took on a project working with six immigrant serving agencies that were developing a service model. He helped a housing project for homeless, pregnant, Indigenous women and was involved in starting an employment and support services program at the Edmonton Food Bank. He also served as deputy executive director at an inner city agency. David's vast background in serving communities plays a vital role in building stronger Edmontonians. And we're so lucky that we get to see that uh, front and center. So for today's panel, what we are going to do is pass the baton over to our guests and each of our guests will give us a short introduction of the special work that they're doing in our community. And I'd like to invite Vanessa to start us off in sharing some of her work with Riverbed Rocks. Great, thank you so much, Bree. Um, so a river bend rock. So first of all, where are we? Um, so we are in the community of Branded Gardens. The photo that you see here is the Savita Branded Gardens complex. And there's 98 units there of townhouses, two to four bedrooms. And just a little bit of background about how we started back in 2009. Um, it was the words of one little girl who lived in this complex who was actually participating in a refugee summer program in Mill Woods. And I said to her, why are you coming all the way to Mill Woods? And her response is, because there's nothing in my neighborhood that I can afford to go to. And for those of you, you know, Branded Gardens in the community of Riverbend, which unfortunately has a bad rap of being that community where those people live, um, you know, upwardly mobile, ex you know, exclusionary, all of that stuff. Um, but anyways, um, we started around a kitchen table in one of the units in a complex with a city social worker, community librarian, and some neighbors to talk about how can we support families, kids like Kel, who are saying there's nothing in our community to, to, that we can do. And one of the first things we did was organize a family fun day in the complex, in the green space that the kids helped organize. And at that fun day, we went around to the ED for the Millwoods Welcome Center, went around just with a little survey and asked all of the participants if there was one thing that we could do that you would want us to do, what would it be? And the number one response was programs for our children. And so that's what got us started. So who are we? We're a collaboration of kids and families, neighbors, community organizations, institutional partners, who are committed to building on community capacities and resilience to create a community where neighbors know one another, where diversity is celebrated, and where all kids and families can flourish. Um, so we run programs under sort of three pillar areas. The first is nurturing children and youth. The second is about supporting adults. And the third, which I'll be talking about today, is about building community. Uh, but just in terms of nurturing children and youth or some of the programs that we run uh, for, for children and youth, we have after school programs for elementary kids. We have a junior high and high school program called Youth Rocks that operates in the, you know, the Twilliga Rec Center. We run a full time summer program for both children and and youth. We have provide access to community supports by working in partnership with local, you know, the soccer association locally, many others. We have a full time, you know, tutoring program where we provide one on one and, and group support to children at for academic programs and things like gym nights. And, you know, you'll see from the photos, everything from soccer to youth programs to field trips. Um, you know, this is what we do in the area of children and youth. Um, just to touch on our other programs, don't have photos for those, but we have a community garden within the complex and in, 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 in adjacent to the community complex. Um, we run a weekly community market uh, with the donations from the Southwest Edmonton Farmers Market and Prairie Urban Farm, and families can just come take a number and pick for themselves what they would like uh, at the community market table. Um, we have a friendship circle for women. We, you know, we, we 
Thanks to Savita, we have this amazing unit in the complex that we got in April that's made us, it possible for us to have a space and a presence right in the complex. And, you know, Tracy facilitated us to have a Make Tax Time Pay program this year. Um, and one of the most important things we do is we create space for community gatherings, whether that's our community get togethers in the green space in the complex or our, you know, um, community suppers that we do at the Riverbend United Church. So that in a nutshell is our pillars. But now to speak about how we do community building in our community. So Nicole, if you can move to the next slides. Yeah, just more pictures from some of our work. But this is the first. So uh, sharing talents and gifts within the broader community. Did we miss, sorry, did I miss a slide? Just go back one, I might have missed one. Yeah, okay. So this is one of the first things we do in terms of building community. And it's about fostering intercultural and intergenerational connection. And for that, uh, creating community gathering spaces, spaces where community can come together is really important. And so whether that's through our community suppers or wherever, uh, but really what this is about is about mutually beneficial relationships. We're a relationship-based model. And, and so, and it's the, the mutuality of those relationships. These are not our clients. This is the us, it's about creating the us. And we use every aspect of our work as an opportunity to build relationships between everyone. Um, and it's we're trying to work for a culture of mutual caring. Um, so that's sort of the philosophy around, um, you know, how we work interculturally and intergenerationally. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Thanks, Nicole. Um, so one of the second ways that we work in terms of building community is sharing talents and gifts within the broader community. And, you know, it's about recognizing the gifts and the talents of those who live in the Savita complex and participate in our program and finding ways to share those. So you see here, this is the first photo is the Swefa market where we have a uh, hair braiding and henna tattoos happening. And the second photo and, and the one with the drummers, we have an African drumming group of kids and they go to perform at like the, the um, the seniors, uh, the retirement village in our community. And after the performance, here's one of our little girls reading to a senior, you know? So it's like, we have gifts and talents to share. Um, let's just move on, you know? Um, there's uh, one of our kids doing a henna tattoo for our MLA, Rocky Pancholi at the Swefa Market and girls doing hair braiding at the Art in Our Park event. Um, and what this is about is it's a recognition and visibility of gifts and talents. And it's about recognizing and celebrating the diversity of our community. When our kids participate in things like the Track 10K and Art in Our Park and the Sweat Market, it says something about our community and who we are. And, you know, it's it's the kids and the families get this, get this feeling that they have something to contribute. They're not they're not the people who need, they're the people who are building our community. And just to speak to that last program, our community suffers. It's women from our community, the moms who work with the Turkey team and cook together in the United Church to serve suppers and truly joyous moments. Okay, let's move on. Um, the third way that we work to, um, to build community is creating opportunities for everyone contribute, to contribute. And that's from the youngest members, um, you know. Um, and so just here, you know, the kids are helping in the community garden. We have this great team called that call themselves the water warriors that water the garden and help to harvest. And here's kids and moms at the community market, you know, working behind the table and helping to serve the food. And the first picture is at one of the community suppers and the women who've helped to cook and the kids are all serving and, you know, being part of that and saying, this is what we have to contribute, being visible for their contributions. Um, next slide, please, Nicole. You know, and I think what that's about is believing and demonstrating that all of us together can make things happen. Um, you know, here's our water warriors again, the kids painting, that's the tennis shack 
right beside the external community garden. And they, with the support of neighbors, painted this amazing mural. I'm sorry I don't have a picture to show it to you of after, but it's now such a thing of beauty. And our kids can go by and say, we helped to make that. And just the picnic benches. This is youth from our community working with board members and neighbors. And they built us six wonderful picnic benches this summer that got used the entire summer. And again, that's that everyone can contribute. And then the final pillar I want to talk about is promoting experiences that result in hope and joy. And, you know, this, I think the pictures say it all for themselves, but I think basically for me, what that's about is that we create a, opportunities that where people dare to dream. They dream about brighter futures for themselves and their kids. Um, we celebrate together. And we, we work together as a community so that everyone feels that they belong. Yeah, so that's it for me. Thank you, Vanessa. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. You um, so articulately describe um, what we see in those photos. And um, I just wanna say I've been lucky enough to uh, be showered with gifts and talents of your community when I've uh, been a guest. And uh, honestly, I've floated home. I floated home. It's so uplifting. Um, the observation of children leading. These are leaders. There are leaders everywhere in this community and they are encouraged and enabled and um, just very, very amazing. So thank you for walking us through that. And I, I think folks on the line would have felt that, felt that floating uh, opportunity as well. Thank you so much. So over to Ms. Patience and uh, Tracy comes to us from Dickensfield, which is uh, more on the north central northwest. Would we call it northwest, Tracy? North, north, we'll call it north. North central, <laughs> I think officially. North central, yeah. So thank you. So it's over to Tracy, who's going to share with us a little bit of what Amity House is up to. Following Vanessa is a hard task, but um, I'll do my best. Uh, so it always strikes me when I'm, I'm talking to some colleagues how the origin stories are very similar. Um, Amity House started almost 52 years ago um, and very much the same way Riverbend Rock started. There's always a librarian, there's always a public health nurse, <laughs> there's always a city social worker who sort of get together and say, hey, this community needs some services, what can we do? And they go from there. So um, that's how we began in 1972. And we have been so grateful to be partnered with Savita and, and been in this site that we're in for next year, 50 years um, in this building, offering services to this amazing community. And we do consider ourselves lucky to be part of this community. This is an amazing community to be in. Um, the community that we work with, um, they're open, they um, are willing to share, they take risks and they're vulnerable and they really make our jobs easy. Um, I'll just talk a bit about our programs because I think everything that we do is community building. Um, you know, even if it's not specific, we wouldn't call it that. Um, so one of our big things is a drop-in. So, you know, like Vanessa said, that safe space, that safe gathering space where people can come in, they can have a coffee, they can have a pastry, they can meet with their neighbors, um, they can meet with our staff, and they can just be. Um, and start making those really important connections. We also have two full-time outreach staff who work intentionally with people one-on-one -on -one and in groups to sort of help them build capacity and, and navigate any challenges they might be having. Um, you know, like Vanessa, it's all very relationship-based that if people don't feel safe with you and they don't trust you, it's very hard for you to do your work. So we work very hard to build those relationships. Um, we do a lot of other things that bring community together and and a lot of, of what we come up with is sort of very community driven. So we do regular needs assessments. We talk to community because we're so small and we're right in the community. We get to hear a lot. Um, and we also sometimes will come up with a program like, say, our cooking club. And I think there's probably a few pictures in there of cooking club, but I they're in no particular order here. Um, cooking club came about because we have a lot of our community members. They show their appreciation with food. And so we were getting food all the time from our community members, you know, to, to say thank you for doing, you know, anything. And, you know, this was great. And not probably for our waistline so much, but it, it was amazing. And, you know, all of these amazing 
dishes. And we thought, how can we make this something that the, the community can benefit from? So we came up with Cooking Club, where we then have these community members come in and, and teach their, their neighbors how to make whatever dish they're making. Um, and the woman who was making it, the, the pan on our stove came with her from the Philippines. Um, and so these things are always so amazing to me. Um, just the, the, the connectedness of it all. Um, we collaborate a lot with, with other people, including you know, um, the people on this panel. We know that we couldn't do what we do by ourselves. It's really important to us that we bring what people need to them. Um, we can't build community if we have to keep sending community away to do the things that they need to do or get what they need. <clears throat> so in our surveys and our assessments and in our listening, we, we try and, and decide what people need. And so we then approach people who do those things really well because we know we're not the experts in everything. Um, so who does these things that we need really well? How can we work with them? How can we maybe have them come and offer those services here with us? Um, so we have Action for Health Communities provides a settlement worker to us once a week. We um, thankfully got a Red Cross grant a little while ago, um, which allowed us to partner with Momentum uh, Counseling Services. And they provide a therapist here once a week, who's also running some groups. We um, have different early childhood services now from the Center for Family Literacy and the Edmonton Public Library who come in and do things and offer those uh, different services that community might need. And we also have a couple of um, collaborations with Kahiwa Wasis um, which formerly Indigenous Birth Alberta. And that's the picture, uh, I think down at the bottom there, the bottom, I think it's yours, bottom left. Um, it's a cooking with auntie program. So it's an Indigenous focused sort of collective kitchen kind of idea where people come together, they cook a meal that they share together that evening and they cook a meal to take home and they have auntie time. And so the facilitator is an amazing woman that we were so lucky to get, Kathy Cardinal. Um, and she really cultivates these relationships among, among these, these people in this group. We also, um, with Kihua Wasiswagamik, have a Kistehata Kameskanam program, which is a baby moccasin or moss bag making program, um, where people come together and learn those teachings and learn how to be, to learn how to make these moccasins that are then given to the, the new babies that Kihua Wasiswagamik are supporting to come in. Um, so it's those things and, and that's building, you know, the larger community as well, um, connecting people to each other um, because it's not just about this little community of Amity House, this little community of, of Dickensfield, it's about our larger community as well and the, and the wellness of the members in our larger community. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. That was uh, just delightful and really appreciate the the pictures that show all of the multicultural, intercultural experiences as well. Um, and I have been lucky enough to, to go and uh, be a guest in your community and um, sit down and eat, <laughs> always eating, uh, eat uh, with folks from your community and the, the uh, topics around connection and relationship and very much hearing similar to where uh, Vanessa took us in those first few minutes around well-being and healing through giving. I keep hearing this this uh, term of we all have something to offer. And it, it's so exciting that um, the programs you guys are a part of and supporting and animating every day create those, those conditions. So that was awesome. And we're only two thirds of the way through our uh, first opening comments. So I'd like to now introduce Mr. David Berger, who is animating, very much animating a space um, in downtown Edmonton called O'Damon Village. So over to you, David. Thank you, Bree. Uh, in many ways, we're the, the new kid on the block uh, when we're compared, say, with uh, Amity House or uh, Brander Gardens. And the reason for that is that we just started our project. Uh, hang on. <laughs> Probably spam. Um, uh, we just started our project uh, eight or nine months ago, and how that got going was uh, the building is uh, used to be called the YMCA Welcome Village on 95th Street and 103rd Avenue, and the building was transferred to Savita effectively March the 1st, and that was actually the start date of the project. And what happened uh, in its uh, genesis 
was that uh, Reach Edmonton and Savita came together and decided uh, really building on each of their expertise that building community where people live is an important goal. And why don't we try to ex expand that kind of effort uh, in other Savita locations? And when it came to be that uh, the Welcome Village was transferred to Savita, the decision was made, why don't we do it there? It's inner city, it's a, a large-ish building, a mix of populations, uh, let's, let's do it there. And, um, and so the project is a two-year project, uh, which is an important point because one of the things that we're trying to accomplish with this is that the project, the project will continue if um, uh, after, uh, well, or the, the work that we're doing has to continue in a way that is, uh, it's a common term, sustainable. So how, how will it continue? So there's nothing that we're doing should be just dependent on the project itself or what we're doing in the moment. It has to be able to be continued. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the people that live in the building. First of all, the building has 148 units, a mix of uh, bachelor, uh, one bedroom and two bedroom units. Uh, there's about a little over 200 people living there, all low income, of course. And the mix is probably in the order of uh, say 30% are indigenous, maybe 20% are newcomers and the rest are a mix of people. And when Savita took over the building, one of the uh, positive things that happened was the ability to lower the rent. It was a near market building for all 148 units. And uh, with the takeover, with the transfer, a uh, hundred of the units became what's called community housing. In other words, residents are paying 30% of their household income. So that, that was uh, uh, well received, shall we say. Uh, there was a lot of angst before the transfer. People were worried what was going to be. And one of the first things we did was try and calm that. And that actually started with the first tenant meeting, uh, which came about in, a, in an interesting way where one of the residents was concerned about uh, how are they gonna pay their rent now? And we were gonna meet with just that person. Instead, he showed up with nine other residents and thus was born our first monthly tenant meeting or resident meeting. And they were very pleased with uh, the news. One of the basic things we always say is that if this is going to be a safe place, if this is going to be a comfortable place, then you have to start with good maintenance practices. And you'll see in your screen on the upper left-hand corner, the property manager for the building is, and for the district is Joanne Cabrera. And she and her team make sure that that building and other buildings uh, have their maintenance well addressed and attend and issues as they come up are addressed quickly and effectively. So what is the project trying to achieve? We have really three, we didn't call them pillars particularly, but three, three buckets, a bucket, a pillar, you can choose. Um, the first one is really uh, nothing new in any of this, but the first thing is to really connect people to services and in a continuing way. Uh, and what does that look like? So for example, we, we are partnering now with Amity House, with Tracy and, and, and her workers that come over about every month or so and uh, help people connect to whether it's a leisure pass or a bus pass or a, a get into a daycare or home care, do income tax. And, and uh, I'm probably committing Tracy uh, early in the game, but this is one of the examples of what we're hoping to do is that when the project ends in 16 months from now, that Tracy will still be there <laughs> and uh, will continue that relationship. Uh, I know of people that have been refugees in the, in the building and Tracy and her team has come over and helped them with various processes or someone else who was looking for another place to live. Uh, because there are more supports available and coming on off hours to help them. What else? The basics, really. When we're looking at, uh, you know, the basics of, of living, of, of surviving, of thriving, um, we're looking at things like food security, access to physical health, 
access to mental health services. Uh, we're, uh, we're also looking potentially at even a link to employment services. Only about 15% of the people in the building of the 200 individuals, there's maybe 15% that are employed. The second bucket is really the social, cultural, recreation piece. And that's the piece of bringing people together to help also create a sense of community. So bucket number one is a part of resiliency, connecting people to services. Bucket number two is helping people to get to know each other, to expand their cultural knowledge, their social opportunities. So for example, we had Bent Arrow come over uh, yesterday. Uh, community garden, one of the residents started a community garden on, virtually on site and, and actually pays for it. He actually puts on uh, dinners and uh, and breakfast and uh, barbecues and birthday celebrations. And um, uh, so we're lo looking at uh, a, a range of social opportunities. We have e 4 he comes over and puts on bingos because I'm a lousy bingo caller, but E4C does it a lot better. And um, we want to do a, a lot of other opportunities on the recreation side, where that's music uh, or bringing in artists. Uh, and in a related way, uh, we have a little space, we call it the multi-purpose room, where people gather and have coffee, can do puzzles and talk to each other, share ideas, talk about their issues, find mutual ways to help each other. So all these pieces, that second bucket is a, uh, an important piece. And the last one uh, is really community safety, neighborhood safety. We're in an area that is challenging. Uh, a block away is an encampment. Uh, on the street, there's lots of drug use. Uh, so we want to re uh, relate. We have neighbors, uh, Urban Manor, for example, across the street and Métis Renaissance. And with the city, we're having conversations about how can we work together to address issues on the street, but in a positive way, not necessarily in a scare people away kind of approach, but how do we address those underlying issues actually that affect people on the street? So those three things, connection to services, connection to social, cultural, recreation opportunities, and community safety, those are really our fundamentals in advancing this new project at uh, O'Damon Village, as it's now known. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, so I've been in the world of evaluation for quite some time as a recovering bureaucrat and public servant. Um, and one of the ways that I like to think about measuring impact is a very um, individual experience of goosebumps. So what are those moments when we hear something, we learn something, we know something, and we know it to be so true and so significant that we get goosebumps. Um, so I would like to share with all three of you, uh, thank you so much for introducing us to your programs, for introducing all of us to your programs um, and the, the goosebumps that uh, that you've all left us with. And here's a, a picture of Mayor Sohi with uh, one of the residents at O'Damon Village. And this was just, was it last week, David? It was very recent. Yes. And, yes. Uh, you know, this would be another example of the word connection has come up connection, connection. It's in every second sentence that I've heard today. Um, and you can see this eye to eye contact and this connection and this, this sense of caring that you feel from even just observing this picture. So thank you guys for introducing us. And so I will point out to the folks on the line that the Q&A uh, area is now open. And uh, as you think about if you have a question for our panelists, uh, which we'd love to pass on or, or send the mic over to you to ask that question. Before we get started uh, with answering questions coming from the group, I'd like to kick us off a little bit um, related to uh, some questions related to what you guys have brought up so far. So the topic of community safety and well-being has come up. It's a very hot topic um, post-COVID. It, it feels acute. I don't think Edmonton is unique in that. I think uh, many of us feel a heightened need around well-being, a heightened need around ensuring safety. Um, I wonder if you guys could share with us uh, some experiences or, or examples of folks that you've connected with, that you have 
observed uh, if for Tracy and for Vanessa in some long-term occurrences, even potentially folks that have, have their journeys have been impacted by each other, by the, the connections they made through program where their own lives, their own families um, have been impacted in positive ways around improving safety or improving well-being. If you have any particular uh, examples, I, I see Vanessa nodding. I wonder if I can throw it over to you first, Vanessa. Um, you know, I think our whole experience has been that. I mean, we have, we see kids in their 20s today who started, who are still connected to us, who started in our after school program, you know, in junior high back in 2012. And the fact that they still come to our suppers or volunteer with us or become our staff is about the difference that we've made. Mm -hmm. And they tell us, they, they tell us those stories as well. I mean, I'll just share anecdotally at one of our community gatherings where we brought in all these stakeholders and we talked about how each of those stakeholders had been part of the journey. And then we opened it up to the floor and there was this one girl who's now, you know, in her twenties, finished university who stood up and said that, when she was able to participate in those summer programs, she could go back to school at the end of September, in the beginning of September. And when the teacher asked, what, what happened? What did you do over the summer? She had wonderful experiences to share. She said, before I would go and hide in school because I had nothing to say. You know, I hadn't done anything and, and the difference that you guys had made. And I think for us, it's about being the village. Um, the connections that people, the relationships that we see amongst and between and the intergenerational and the intercultural and the, the joy in being together, that's how we know we've made a difference in terms of well-being. Um, and then I also will just say about safety. So there's physical safety and the fact that, you know, families know one another and they know each other's kids and they're present and out in the garden, their presence outside and that knowledge uh, creates physical safety. But there's also all of that about emotional safety, which is about feeling that you as an immigrant or you someone of a different race or a different culture are appreciated and welcomed and belong. And, and so it's all about that. Mm. So powerful. Just that, that everyone needs to belong, right? And that, that sense of belonging is so core to, to well-being. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, for sharing that. And, and I've had the opportunity to meet your young people that grew up in your program and are now giving back as volunteers or as staff. And it's a, it's a very special uh, full circle moment. Uh, and they're very vocational and very passionate. So the giving just continues. Um, over to Tracy or David. Would uh, Tracy, would you like to share an example of something you've observed or been a part of? I... I I think so. I mean, Vanessa, again, captured it beautifully. Um, and I would concur with a lot of hers. And I, too, get to see some of these kids coming back to us as adults, which is is amazing. Um, one of the other things that, that we have, so we have a lot of adult programming. We don't have, we've got the Boys and Girls Club down the street. They take care of, you know, the, the child and youth piece. Um, but part of our community is also unhoused. So there are people who become unhoused in this community. And so they also come and, and into the center, they're part of the community. Um, and I, I think some of the beautiful things that I see is putting in a community space and having this community space takes away the othering um, look rough and who, who was houseless and who was just sitting in my neighborhood. This is now uh, this is Bob, my, my neighbor, <laughs> right? This is somebody that, that I connect with that that I care about um we have a, a man who comes in here and he's in here almost every day he's he also full-time for us for free he's it's like full-time volunteer um, he has built this really special relationship with this little girl who comes in after school with her mom this little tiny blonde girl and and watching them together I wish I could have sent in a picture um you know, there's this really, really big, large man and they play and she like uses him as a chair. She, <laughs> she sits on him and watches her mom's phone and um, they just have this beautiful relationship. And I think that can happen in, in community spaces where, again, people are valued. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone has something to give. Everyone is, is recognized and special and part of a community, no matter what might happen. 
Thank you, Tracy. Tracy, you're break. You're glitching just a little bit. We completely understood your message, but I think you might be in a glitch mode at this moment. So just a heads up on that if you can still hear us. Um, David, I wonder if you have an example that you'd like to share with us. Well, we're in a little bit of a different space than the more mature uh, organization. Uh, Brenda and Amity House. Um, and nevertheless, uh, although we've only been at it eight or nine months, there are a few examples of people coming together. Uh, and that's a long process for people to get comfortable with each other and to reach out, as it were. Um, so we have a visiting choir from the, down, the downtown men's choir. And we have a few people that are kind of edging up towards as the choir is rehearsing and they come every Monday, uh, they kind of edge up closer to the choir and start to sing a little bit and uh, get to know the choir master, Eva Bostrand, who's very, very engaging and the rest of the, the, the choir. The, the community space also is becoming the multi-purpose room is becoming a place where people can just let down their guard a little bit uh, and talk to each other and help solve each other's issues a little bit and plan together. Um, but I think what's interesting, I think, is the the fact that where we're at in this relationship and this effort. And that is that at the beginning stage, we're we're seeing a lot of people that have trauma. And they tell us their stories of trauma, of childhood abuse, of neglect, abandonment. And every once in a while that comes up and you hear about it and you know how far we have to go to uh, help uh, and work with folks, to uh, link them to supports and help them feel part of community. Uh, yesterday when we had Bent Arrow over, had uh, one resident talking about how they feel so so excluded from the broader, in this case, indigenous community for different reasons, uh, but uh, it was the opportunity to talk about it and to ask for strategies or suggestions rather uh, of what to do about such circumstances. Uh, so I think that as we we get to know people more as people open up to each other. We will learn more about people's needs. For example, we will be doing a survey to find out about needs and uh, and uh, what people would like to do. Uh, and, and, and we'll sort of build from, from there. So it is early days, but I think the level of trauma that we do see among some residents is at times very shocking and just shows us what a what a hill we have to climb together. Thank you for that, David. Uh, so many key reminders that you shared with us just now. One of them around the timeline of um, the community development um, and uh, what you're already seeing in an eight month period, but also a reminder around all of us have our stories and we come with our history and with our journeys. And uh, for folks who are living in poverty and facing multiple, multiple challenges, um, such an important piece to remember that this is not day one of a story. This is generations of stories in many cases that are, are sitting with us today and connecting with us today and how to, to connect in and, and find ways together. And the other um, piece I heard you talk about, you know, uh, that person who expressed uh, that sense of not feeling a part of or different than, um, and that opportunity to discuss and address and find ways into uh, addressing those challenges. And I think it reminds us um, life's hard. Life is hard. It's harder uh, when you're facing uh, challenges around scarcity. It's harder when you're facing histories of, of trauma and generational histories of trauma. And there are ways forward and there are ways through and there are ways to stay connected. And that word connection just keeps coming up in this conversation, which I'm so grateful for. We are coming close to the end of our time. If you can imagine that, I feel like we just got, we're just getting warmed up here, folks. Um, as we close, I would invite each of our guests and maybe I'll go in reverse order. How's that? <laughs> If that's all right with folks, I'll, I'll go back to David first and Tracy will keep you nicely in the middle and 
uh, finish off with Vanessa. And the invitation right now is, is to close off this conversation. Um, you're invited to think about the concept of hope. It's something that came up frequently throughout this conversation today. Uh, hope and resilience. Um, anything you're leaving with, any reflections, any wisdom, anything you'd like to share for those who are listening online today thinking, what could I do in my community or how, what should I step forward to support uh, as a volunteer, as a staff person, um, anything, really your, your closing reflections or your closing thoughts. So David, over to you. Well, you, you use the term, uh, the word resiliency, and that really it captures, I think, what we're all trying to achieve together. And uh, so what is resiliency? It, it really is the ability to bounce back uh, from various life challenges as they come up or as they stay with you. M many challenges just stay with us throughout our lives. And I think our role in trying to build resiliency sometimes is on the outside looking in. We, we, we do a few things. We try to help. Um, it's difficult to achieve those objectives when you're fundamentally a housing provider in many respects, and you're, re and you're kind of going at the edges to bring services in from, uh, from the outside to, to help folks. And it's a huge challenge to, to help people address and build their resiliency when you're constantly looking for resources that are not there, that are difficult to access, that you require a lot of navigation. And this is from the point of view of the resident. So if I left anyone with a thought about what could we do, and it would be that our folks struggle with navigating. We struggle with navigating and getting supports closer to us. I think we need a rethink of how services are delivered or some services are delivered. Why can't we bring more? Why can't we see government in particular bringing services to us, to where the need is, to the location of where need is housed rather than us always searching. So we're helping people navigate. We're, we're better at it because we understand systems, but our folks don't. And it shouldn't require a navigator always to look out and, and sail the ship to the, the, the good port. Let the port come to us from time to time. And I, I give one example and I'll, I'll, I'll stop yapping, but at the agent, one of the agent, the agents that I worked at uh, in the housing department, we had someone from social services come and spent, as it turned out, only three or four months. But having that person there and help them access uh, uh, income support, navigate through reporting systems and, and access other services were, was great. And then it was yanked. But the whole idea is let the system come to us. Let, let the system look at ways to come to where the housing is being provided because we, we're only doing one piece of it. And if we're gonna have a collaboration, I think it's gotta be with uh, particularly government systems being more open to coming home to where we live. Excellent, David, thank you. Thank you for that systems ob observation, I, I love it. Uh, Tracy, we're, I'm gonna pass the baton to you and just this just in, <laughs> there was a, a question in the chat. You used the, the word risk as you were talking about uh, be prepared to take some risks. It was some language you used earlier. And the question coming from the chat, should you choose to address it <laughs> after I've already asked you uh, to, to leave some closing thoughts is, um, can you explain more about what you mean about by risks and what those risks might be? If that fits in with some of your, sure. your closing comments, Tracy, we'd really appreciate it. Thanks so much. <laughs> I will try. I can even just address that briefly. I think I think risk is moving out of your comfort zone, really. So in community work, sometimes you've got to move out of, of what's comfortable for you um, to meet people where they are. Um, you know, I, I don't mean you know swinging from chandeliers kind of risk. I mean like you know those those personal risks and being vulnerable, being a little vulnerable for people, and sort of letting people see that we are people too. So we work in the community. We are 
professionals in the community, um, but we are also part of the community and we're people. And, and, you know, sometimes we'll make mistakes too, and don't be afraid to fail. You know, I, failure is, is learning. Um, in closing, um, I love the word connection. Um, and I think everyone can do something. So what I would say is as we go off into our communities, whether it's the communities we work in, communities we live in, communities, you know, that, that we're in for whatever reason, we all play a part. And, and those little pieces of connection, um, just even just a smile sometimes really changes someone's day. So never forget those little pieces that can really turn someone. Tracy, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder of how powerful and influential each of us are um, and how we have the gift to do something good with that. Thank you. Uh, Vanessa, over to you for some closing thoughts. Um, so I'm going to say from the heart. And, you know, when you talk about connection and mutual relationships, it's really about mutual caring. And, you know, one of the things that we know when we work with kids is they say they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And it's the same for every human being, isn't it? That I think that's the door opener for us. And so it's about creating opportunities, not just for you as an organization to show how much you care, but for others in your community to get to 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 be connected in in real life touching ways that 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 move hearts. Because it's those stories, it's those conversations, it's those doing together at a heart level um, that that leads people to have deep uh, connections. And so, yeah, from the heart. Wow. Well, you know, some people think that virtual is harder to connect. And yet I'm having this warm, fuzzy glow all over the place. So I just want to say a huge thank you to our panelists today uh, for sharing your wisdom, for sharing the stories of your community, for doing what you do every day, for doing it, letting us be a partner in that. Uh, from a Savita housing perspective, we are honored and privileged to be a partner in that. I also want to give a quick shout out to the tech team who's been, they've looked really calm, but they've been working away behind the scenes. So. Thank you, everyone. Happy Affordable Housing Month. Uh, thank you and have an awesome, beautiful uh, fall weekend. Take good care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Nicole. Bye. Bye.